Good evening. How's everyone doing? Okay, yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, delayed reaction. Yeah. <laughs> Took a minute for the sound waves to get out there. Um, just a couple of announcements. Ladies, you got your uh, Practice of Godliness Bible study uh, on Tuesday, and that is at Barbara's Home, 10007 West Virginia Avenue in Dunbar. So I encourage you to take hold of the bulletin, ladies, and and see what your work is that you're going to be uh, dealing with. And then Wednesday, we'll be back here. And on Wednesday, we've been taking it to have, uh, I preach a short message, then we have a short Q&A on the series that we're uh, dealing with. And so I encourage you to be here Wednesday. And then Thursday uh, is our National Day of Prayer. And so that is going to be on the Capitol steps at noon. And so I want to encourage you to be a part of that. Uh, it'll be uh, from noon to 1, 1 15. And so, again, it, this is a national. This isn't like a West Virginia Day of Prayer. Even that's cool, too. I like West Virginia Day of Prayer. West Virginia needs to pray, don't we? Um, and, uh, but this is a national day of prayer, and it's happening all over the nation. And I pray that, uh, and I, I pray that you will uh, take up the mantle and begin to pray and join with other people to pray as well. And so, again, that is uh, this Thursday at noon. And so I encourage you to be a part of that. And then uh, on the 24th of May, that is a Friday at 6 p.m. Uh, there's going to be a worship night at the Capitol. And uh, I, I think it's on the Capitol steps. All of the rest of them that I've seen around the nation that Sean Foyt is doing, they're on the steps of the Capitol. And so, uh, but that is the 24th at 6 p.m. Friday. Uh, and so I encourage you to uh, be a part of that. We've got lots of stuff coming up in June and July. Obviously, we have Mother's Day uh, in May, and so we've got Father's Day in June, and so we've got lots of stuff coming on. We've got Revival in June. We've got Revival in July, and so both of these, uh, uh, Courtney Lowe from London, England, is going to be here uh, preaching for us in June, and uh, then uh, in July, actually, Courtney's former pastor, uh, Pastor Carnegie, uh, was in London for 10 years and uh, pastored there. And Courtney came in and got saved under Pastor Carnegie. And so, but Ma Pastor Carnegie will be here uh, on the 14th of July following Every Heart uh, Invasion Teams. Amen. A lot of stuff. We'll keep making announcements as we go on. And so I encourage you to grab a bulletin. And we, we learned a great hymn this morning. Precious Lord, take my hand. Oh, my gosh. Born out of tragedy. Um, that song was born out of tragedy, and God has used it through the ages to minister to so many, many different people. And so, anyway, grab a bulletin, and uh, get. that's our schedule. I'm going to have the ushers come this evening. We're going to take our tithes and offerings and want to encourage you. Be faithful uh, to give uh, to uh, this congregation. Uh, if you're part of another congregation, your tithe belongs to that congregation. Uh, but we are a people that we want to see God move, use our church, use our lives for His glory. And so I want to encourage you to be a part of giving uh, and be a part of winning the world for Jesus. And so we're going to take our tithes and offerings if you're giving online. All the ways to give are there on the screen beside of me. If you're writing a check, you can write it to CCFC. Bow your heads uh, this evening. We're going to pray. David, lift your voice and bless the gift and giver. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Uh, tonight, why don't you open your Bibles again to the book of Nehemiah? I am not going to spend a lot of time uh, in this text. We covered it somewhat this morning. But I am in a series entitled The Seven Pillars to a Healthy Church. 
And uh, right now, uh, starting this morning and then on through Wednesday, I am dealing with the second pillar, and that is a defined focus. If we are going to be a healthy church, number one, we have to have what? Number one, a clear vision. That's number one, a clear vision. You can't have a focus if you don't have a vision because you don't have nothing to focus on, right? So clear vision, and does anybody know what our clear vision is? Evangelism, discipleship, church planting. Hey, we, here we go. This evangelism, evangelism is first because you can't disciple people that aren't evangelized. And so we evangelize, we disciple, and then we send them out into the world to start churches uh, wherever God calls them to go. And so that is our clear vision. And Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2 says, write the vision on tablets, make it plain so that whoever reads it can run with it. Amen. You can run with a clear vision, but when you're not sure, you're always hesitating. Is this the right thing? Is this the way to go? But when it's clear, you can run, and you can run, and you can run, and I pray that you will lock into the vision and run with it. One prominent leader said, and I'm just going to uh, kind of recap a little bit this morning, but one leader said these words, ministry that make the greatest impact seem to focus on a limited set of targets. They tend to do a few things as if all of eternity hinged on their results. They do these things with godly excellence. And there are so many, and I read an illustration this morning about a pastor of a church of about 400 people who had 187 ministries. And some people would be really proud about that, but the problem, you can barely do two or three ministries well. But I guarantee you 187 ministries, you're spread so thin, you miss so much. See, knowing what we're called to do is so important, but also knowing what we are not called to do is just as important. And one pastor said... I know you have a to-do list, but just as important is your to-don't list. See, we don't think that in ministry. We think, do this and do this and do this and get involved and do that and do this. And then we, the thing we are called to do, evangelism, discipleship, church planning, we are just too plumb tired to do any of it. But see, we're not called to get involved in every special interest, every issue, but we are called to evangelize, to disciple, and to plant churches. Everything we do, beloved, from a birthday party to a wedding, we want to see people get saved. We want to see people know Jesus. We want whatever we do to glorify God. And so, Nehemiah chapter 6 gives us a good picture of a man who was focused. And it's in verse 1 through verse 4. You can read all in Nehemiah again. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But the Bible says, Now it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors in the gates, Samballot and Geshem sent me a message saying, come let us meet together among the villages in the plain of, oh no, don't let anybody invite you to the plain of, oh no. But here's what Nehemiah said, but they thought to do harm to me. And here's what he said in verse three. So I sent a message back. And I said, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it to go down to you? But here, the thing that caught my attention was verse 4 because that answer wasn't good enough. Because it says they sent this same message back to Nehemiah four different times. Verse 4, but they sent me this message four times. And I answered them the same four times. 
See, don't change your answer, everybody. No matter how much pressure they put on you to not go to church on Sunday night or Wednesday night or go on outreach or, or preach that sermon, no matter how much they pressure you, give them the same answer. There's a great work that I'm a part of. Why should I stop the work and come down and do what you're asking me to do? Listen, it's all about the work. Listen to me, y'all. It's all about the work of God. From COVID to our own issues, it's all about the enemy wanting to use what life puts on us to cease the work of God. And we have to make a decision. The work of God is priority. The work of God is the priority of all life. So I, I just gave you a challenge this morning before I get into my five one things that I'm going to talk about. But if you could do, if you could only do one thing to impact the world for Jesus, what would you do? If you could only do, not me, you. If you could only do one thing for, to impact the world, for Jesus Christ, what would you do? And then my next question is, are you doing that? Well, no, no one's asked me. Are you kidding? I'm asking you right now. You need to begin to move in your gifting. You need to begin to move in the thing that God's called you to do, to impact the world with the gospel. Listen, this is why, I mean, I, this sermon is for me. This series is for me. This is why, you know, I, I was telling Aaron this morning, I don't do a lot of things well. I'm not super creative, you know, but I can preach, and I have to work hard at that, and I have to be nice when I preach because I can be mean sometimes. So I've got to, thank you, Dennis, I've got to, you know, I've got, I've got to get that. And the other thing I can do is sing. And so what I'm going to do on Friday or Saturday nights, I haven't decided, I'm starting a concert downstairs in our basement. Here, not in my house. Here, at the church. Some of y'all might be like, you need to sing in the basement. Well, I'm going to, and it's going to be here. We're going to outreach our city, and we're going to say, we're having a concert tonight, and we're going to give you coffee and donuts. Everybody loves coffee and donuts. And we'll give them coffee and donuts and Jesus. I was reading about a pastor. He pastored in uh, San Antonio. And in the middle of the day, he would go downtown and he would invite businessmen. And they would come and he said, I, will, I want to give you a sandwich, a little lunch, and a gospel chat is what he called it. I know that he took this right out of the 70s at Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco. That's what they were doing. But he started doing that. And at the beginning, there were like three businessmen that came, five businessmen, 12. And all of a sudden, word got out that something was happening down at the Methodist church uh, that God was moving in the lives of men and women. See, we've got to move on what God has gifted us to move in and be fine with that. Not look at everybody else, oh, I wish I could do. You can't. So just do what you, you are called to do. Do what you are gifted to do. I've encouraged this congregation over the last nine years. Some of you should write books. Some of you are poets. Some of you are songwriters. Some of you are teachers. Some of you need to be entrepreneurs and start businesses. Some of you, we need to step out in giftings. Why? To glorify God. If you could only do one thing to impact the world for Jesus, what would you do and are you doing it? And then my third question is, why not? <laughs> if you're not doing it, why not? Why aren't you? So I want you to open your Bibles to Psalms chapter 27. We got a lot of scripture to run through tonight. And uh, I have a very short time to do it, so I'm going to speak fast, so listen quick. Number one, I want to talk about the five one things of the Bible. Five one things of the Bible. Number one is one thing I 
ask. This is a psalm in Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And this verse, I'm telling you right now, I'm not even talking about the American church. I'm talking about churches through the ages have such a difficult time getting their head around this verse. It literally makes no sense. I mean, I'm not talking about the words. Of course, you can read them. They're English words. I'm talking about the revelation of the verse. One thing, he says, one thing I have desired of the Lord that I, and and I'm going to seek this out. This one thing I'm going to go after. What's that one thing that you could be rich, that you could be famous, that God would use you to touch thousands? No, that one thing is that I could dwell in the house of God. Folks, I know I'm just a pastor, and I'm always tooting the horn of coming to church, but I cannot dismiss verses like this. I don't know how people can read verses like this and go, yeah, I don't feel like going to church tonight. I don't feel like being in the house of God tonight. I don't see how people can read verses like this and interpret it any other way. One thing I have desired One thing I will seek, and that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And this verse emphasizes the desire, very simply, to be in the house of God. The second one thing is found in Mark chapter 10. And listen, I want you to write these down, read them later, and just ask God about them. One thing you lack. Mark 10, 21. Then Jesus looking at him, this is talking about the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler came and said, Rabbi, how must I, how can I inherit eternal life? And this is the next verse. Then Jesus looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come take up your cross and follow me. One thing you lack. You read this verse and you think, what's the one thing that he lacked? The one thing that he lacked uh, was the one thing that he had. And that was a love for the material world. He said, you're lacking a love for spiritual things. You're lacking a love for the godly. You're lacking a love for the things of God. And Jesus' instruction to this rich young ruler to sell all that he has and not just sell it and put the money in the bank, right? Sell it and give it to the poor and follow him. It underscores the importance of prioritizing kingdom obedience over material possessions. See, if you are still bound up in material possessions and not giving to the kingdom, then you lack something. Y'all might as well say amen because I'm going to keep preaching it. You're lacking. You're losing out, brother. Sister, you're losing out on the blessing of the kingdom. Oh, you may have, like this rich young ruler. The Bible said he walked away sad because he had a lot. And to sell everything was to sell a lot. And he walked away sad. Listen, he walked right out of Scripture. You never hear from him again. He walked right out of the will of God. Why? Because he lacked a love for heavenly things, for kingdom business. He had to hold on to his money and his material possessions. One thing, see, these, this is two one things of the Bible. So here's the third one thing of the Bible. One thing is needful. Luke chapter 10, verse 42. Jesus is speaking with Martha and Mary. And Martha's complaining that Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning while Martha's making dinner. Verse 42, Jesus says, but one thing is needful. One thing is needed. 
And Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. See, Jesus is telling Martha that Mary has chosen the one thing that is needed, and that is sitting and listening of the teachings of Jesus. Folks, why are we continuing to add things to our life day after day? Do this project and that project and this event and go to that event. And we never stop to learn what Jesus would say. Folks, I believe Christians should pray. Not just in church. But I believe before we're making major decisions, before we're adding things to our life, we need to pray, God, is this what you want me to do? Is this the direction you want me to go? Or is this just trying to waste my time? Is this just trying to take away from something else that you would rather me do? But we don't pray like that. We just see it, a friend invites us, or something happens, oh, that looks really good, oh, I want to do that, and we just, off we go. Listen, you are a child of God. You are a child of the Father, and He wants you to do things in His kingdom. See, I'm talking about defined focus, not just this random, haphazard, do-whatever, anytime focus but is a defined focus. See, again, we as a congregation, me as a pastor, we're very narrow focused. We want to win Chesapeake for Jesus. We want to win Marmette and East Bank and Bell and DuPont and Henshaw and all these other little places. You know, we want to win them for Jesus. But listen, it's not going to happen if we don't go. The church has to rise up and go. And bring the gospel message to a lost and dying world. That is the, the vision of the Bible. Y'all need to say amen better than that. Come on, y'all. If you don't believe it, that's fine. But if you believe it, you got to say something because that's what we are focused to do. It's a defined focus. It's not like, oh, I don't know, what are you saying, Pastor Bill? What I'm saying is take some flyers, go knock on a door, and say, hey, I want to tell you about Jesus. That's what I'm saying. Go to your classmates, your teacher, the banker, the grocer. Do you know Jesus? Would you like to come to church and hear about him? Number four, one thing I do. Now, this scripture is always um, not confuse me, but I, I read it and I go, Paul says one thing I do, and then he mentions three things that he does. <laughs> but he says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead, and I press on to the goal of the prize of the upward calling God in Christ Jesus. I'm like, wait a second. You said one thing I do, and you just named three things. That is not one thing. That's three things. But what he's saying, he's saying, number one, if you don't forget the things behind you, you will never m move forward. If you don't forget the failures, the letdowns, the offenses, uh, the disappointments, uh, if you don't put those behind you, you're going to have a difficult time pressing on to greater things and believing that God can use you to change lives. But he says, I don't count my, I have not apprehended. I haven't, in other words, I haven't arrived. Nobody's arrived here, y'all. Nobody has arrived. We are all still fighting the good fight of faith. But what he says, one thing I do. And so, so what, I just had to speak to myself, a little self-talk. And I had to say, you know, don't get caught up in the three things he mentions. Get caught up in the one thing he said he did. I forget those things that are behind me. See, that's what he did. I forget those things that are behind me. And he didn't say, I forget the bad things that are behind me. He says, I forget it all. I leave it behind me because I can't change it. I couldn't change it if I wanted to change it, and God won't change it. 
So one thing I do, I forget those things that are behind me. That way, I can move forward. See, it's one thing. It's a defined focus. Can you have that focus today? Maybe some things that have happened in your past. People have disappointed you. People have talked down to you. Maybe being raised by people who put you down all the time, said you couldn't do. Maybe that's hard to get over. I'm telling you, God's speaking a different message. God's speaking a different word to you. And He would say you can because I'll help you. But what we've got to do is one thing. Forget those things that are behind me. Shut those voices down. And listen to the voice of truth that says, I will use your life. It's a defined focus. And the last thing, number five, is one thing I know. I love this story. One thing I know. This is about a blind man that Jesus healed. The blind man had no idea who healed him. Jesus healed him and Jesus left. And he's like, who healed me? Where did he go? And then he started getting interrogated by the Pharisees. Who healed you? I, I don't know. I, I didn't, get to, get, didn't catch his name, <laughs> you know. You know. Jesus didn't like all the other evangelists around that wanted to give you his name and sign his latest book. But this guy's like, I don't know who he is. He didn't tell me who he was. And so here's the encounter. And he answered them, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. One thing I know. Folks, don't ever forget that one thing. That, you, that one thing when you were addicted to sin, addicted to alcohol, addicted to drugs, addicted to sex, addicted to uncleanness. You were addicted to porn. You were addicted to money. You were addicted to the love of this world. And Jesus Christ set you free. See, listen, I don't know everything, but I do know what He did for me. See, that's the one thing that you need to hold on to. That's the one thing that you can always bring to people who want to argue theological debates with you. And you can very simply say, look, I don't know all the theology. I don't know the four laws of this and the six laws of that. But one thing I know is I once was lost, but now I ain't lost no more. Now I'm on my way to heaven. Now I can live life to make a difference. Now I can live life with actually something to live for. One thing I see again, defined focus. I don't know everything, but one thing I know, I was blind, but I ain't blind no more. I can see. See, again, it's not getting lost in all the busyness. All of the conglomeration of events and things. and The world will just swallow you up with that. Will swallow you up with every event, every idea. And I'm not saying it's wrong to be well read and, and listen to things and all of that. But I will encourage you to keep a godly perspective about these things. Keep a heavenly perspective. Don't let ungodly counsel, ungodly knowledge uh, convince you to be unbiblical. And the world will do that to you because they sound so smart. Because they are. <laughs> They're really smart. But see, you're, you're wise. You've got the Word of God. You've got the Spirit of God living in you. There's a wisdom in you. See, it's one thing. See, we need to keep our eye on one thing. And the one thing that this congregation that we are committed to, that is winning the loss for Jesus. We are committed to that. We're going to stay committed to that. We'll do it however we need to do it with, uh, you know, again, bounce houses and hot dog parties and music, whatever we got to do. You know, the group Every Heart, they're talking to me about wanting to do a block party. I'm like, man, I ain't heard about a block party since like 1985. And I don't even know how to do a block party. But they're like, let's do a block party. Let's get the youth. Let's go out. For they're from Michigan, and they love West Virginia. 
They love people. They want to see peace. See, it's one thing. See, that's why we can stay focused. Let me just finish. This one thing I know prioritizes who Jesus is over what he knew about Jesus. He didn't know anything. He didn't even know his name. He didn't know all the theology and didn't even know who he was. All he knew is what Jesus did for him. Do you know what Jesus did for you? Let me ask you this. Do you know what Jesus did for you? Let me ask you a second question. Is that good enough? You know, I heard this years ago. I don't know if I was a new believer, young believer, older believer. I can't remember when I heard it. But it was this. If Jesus never did another thing for you in your entire life, is what he has already done enough for you? Is it enough for you to serve him? Is it enough for you? Or does he keep having to perform for you? Is it enough? Has he done enough for us? For us to say, you know what? I'm, I'm all in, man. You don't got to do another thing for me, Lord. I'm all in. You don't got to heal me. You don't got to, you know, save this and do that or provide here and give me a bunch of money. And, oh, you got to honor my tithe, Lord. Oh, I've been tithing all these years. You got to, you don't got to do nothing for me anymore. God, I am sold out for you. Is what he has done enough? Or does he have to keep, <laughs> keep Jesus on the hamster wheel? Keep going, Lord. You got to keep doing it. Because you know, you know, we know people are like that, right? Oh, the Lord let me down. So I ain't serving him no more. What do you mean he let you down? He died on a cross for you. Is that not enough? No, the world let you down. Life let you down. People let you down. It wasn't Jesus. See, all five of these verses represent a defined focus in life. Someone said there are three kinds of people that are guaranteed to fail. An unteachable person, an undecided person, and an unfocused person. And I want to encourage every one of you in this place, even those watching live stream, there's no reason for us as a congregation to be unfocused. We have a very clear vision, evangelism, discipleship, church planning. Let's take that vision. Let's focus on it. God, where is my place in that I may not be a church planter, but I can give to church planting. I may not be able to go out and knock on the door and evangelize, but I can pray for those who are knocking on doors. I can play a part. My role is valuable, but we've got to find that place and focus on that place and obey. Why? Because God's doing a great work. And God is doing a great work, man. All I, see, it's easy for me because I'm up here looking at all y'all saying, you know, God's doing a great work. And there's other great works that aren't even here tonight that he's doing a great work in them. He's doing a great work. Let's not allow the enemy to distract us. Let's stay focused on what God would have us do. Why don't you bow your heads with me tonight? The Lord bless you. I appreciate you coming tonight and sitting your, setting your Sunday evening aside to come into this place and hear the Word of God. I want to encourage you tonight to let God speak to you. Let God help you. Let God touch you. Let God bring something out of you that isn't brought out of you yet. Let God bring something out of you. Let Him challenge you tonight. Let Him challenge you in your spirit tonight. Maybe you say, Lord, I don't know all that I can do, but you know what? I can be generous. I don't know all that I can do, but Lord, I can tell people about you. I don't know all that I can do. I don't know that I can preach, but Lord, I can pray for the preacher. I don't know all that I can do, but God, I want to do something. I want to focus on what you would have me do. And Lord, I want to know what you don't want me to do. I want to encourage you tonight to let the Lord minister to you. 
Listen, maybe there's someone here, someone watching, and you need to know Jesus. You've never asked Him into your heart. You've never said, Jesus, come live in my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. You've never repented of your sin. You've never walked to Jesus and allowed Him to forgive you. But tonight, God is speaking. God is dealing with hearts and lives tonight. And you would be honest and say, yes, uh, Pastor Bill, would you pray for me? I want to give my life, rededicate my life to Jesus. I don't want to continue to live my own way, but I want to live my life for Jesus. If that's you tonight, or maybe you're watching online, I just want you to type it there online. I want to know Jesus, or I want to rededicate my life. If that's you tonight, I want you to lift your hand and say, yes, pray for me. I want to rededicate my life to Jesus, or I want to know Jesus. Would you let me pray for you tonight? Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Anyone else? God is dealing with hearts and lives tonight. Listen, please do this for me tonight. Even though all of my communication and all of the things that I say may not have been perfect and may have come across differently or or whatever it may be, but my encouragement for you tonight is don't miss God. Don't miss what God is wanting to say. Because my fear, my fear is that people would sit under the preaching of the Word of God My fear is that people would sit under the preaching of the Word of God and not be changed. My fear is that people would sit under the preaching of the Word of God and still live a life of disobedience. That's my fear. I'm telling you, I fear this in my spirit when I pray. I'm like, oh God, because I know, I know things that God speaks to me, and I'm like, oh God, help them break down the walls, Lord. Break down the walls. Don't let them continue to walk in willing disobedience. And I want to encourage you tonight, let tonight be the night that that wall is broken down. Let tonight be the night where you say, you know what, no more. I'm not going to continue to disobey. I'm not going to continue to walk in willing disobedience. But I am going to begin to walk in obedience. I'm going to begin to give my life, give my all for Jesus. I am no longer just going to be a consumer but I am going to be contributing to the Gospel. All over this assembly, maybe God is dealing with you, speaking to you. We're going to sing a song of worship. And these altars are open tonight. You want to come, find a place to pray. You come as we worship God uh, tonight in this place. Fix my eyes on you. The author of my faith. Passing aside every sin in every way. Oh, I lift my eyes. I fix my eyes on you. Lay my burden I down. Lay my burdens down. Letting, Letting the cares of this world not fade away. One thing. One thing I ask. This one. I may dwell in your house, O Lord, my King. And all the days of my life, I want to gaze upon you and seek you in this whole place. I fix my eyes on you. The author of my faith, and casting aside every sin and every way. 
I fix my eyes on you. I lay my burdens down and letting the cares of this world not fade away. Thank you. And one thing I ask is one, one thing I seek that I may dwell in your house. Lord, my King, all the days of my life, God. all the days of my life, I want to gaze upon you, Jesus, and seek you in this holy, holy place. And one thing I ask, is one thing. I may dwell in your house, O oh Lord, my King. And all the days of my life, I want to gaze upon Jesus and seek you in this holy, holy place. And one thing I ask, this one. Well, in your house, O oh Lord, my King. And all the days of my life, I want to gaze upon your beauty. And you in this whole place. One thing I ask. One thing I ask. One thing. That I may dwell, I may dwell in your house, oh Lord, Lord my King, yeah, yeah. all the days of my life, I want to gaze upon your beauty, and seek you in this holy place, all the days, all the days of my life. Upon your beauty, seek you in this holy place. Hey, Devon, I want to pray for you. I want you to come. I've known Devon for a long time now, and glad you're back. I was thinking today, I'm so blessed that you're here. You know, I was thinking when I was sitting in the hospital, it's like, man, I'm really glad Devon's coming to church, you know. And, um, but I really feel like that this time around is different, that God's doing something special in your heart. And there may be reasons why you're like, hey, I'm, I'm going back. It may be whatever. I, you know, I don't know all the situations and circumstances, but God's brought you here so that he can begin to raise you up because you're not, how old are you? Yeah, I was going to say you're not 14 anymore. <laughs> you know 19 years old and i believe this is your time i really do but i want to just encourage you that the enemy is going to do exactly what i preach tonight he's going to throw this at you and he's going to throw that at you and he's going to bring that person and these people and these voices and you're going to have to make that defined decision to say no god's doing something different in my life. I remember when I was 19 and I gave my life to Jesus. That's when I got saved. I surrendered my life. I didn't even know what I was doing, but I just knew I needed to do something different. And I surrendered my life when I was 19, hey, 60 years old now, and God has continued to help me and grow me, and I've still got a lot of growing to do. So what I want to encourage you to do is don't get down, don't give up, don't give in. You get that defined focus and say, no, this is different. This is different. God's doing something different. And you just let God do what, you just let God make you who he's made you. You know, it's not like, you know, all these things have to be different now. No, God's made you who he's made you. So let him use you. Okay? Let him use you the way he wants to use you. Okay? Does that make sense? And so I just want to pray for you right now. Can I do that? 
Amen. Lord, I am thanking you for Devon, Lord. I am thanking you for his life. I thank you for bringing him back into this place, Lord, a place that, God, we consider home, Lord, your house. And I thank you for bringing him in this place and the blessing, God, that he is. God, to all of us that have known him all these years, and God, I thank you for his life and what you're doing right now. God, and it's not like before, God, but it is a a work of your spirit, God, a work of growth, God, that you are doing in his life, and God, you are going to separate him for your glory. And I pray that you would bless him right now tonight. God, let him take what you're speaking to him, God, and let it get down deep in his spirit. Lord, that nothing can stand in the way of what you want to do in his life. And I pray you bless him, Lord, right now, and I give you thanks for my brother in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate it. Love you, brother. Thank you. Amen. Let's give God praise. Yes, yes, yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Listen, we're going to close in prayer tonight. Why don't we stand uh, together? We'll be here Wednesday uh, to just uh, close out this particular series, Define Focus. And then we'll continue the seven pillars of a healthy church. And, and uh, number one is a clear vision. Number two is a defined focus. And we want to keep that focus on what God has for us. So let's pray. Uh, let's be dismissed tonight. The Lord bless you as you go. Uh, Dennis, you lift your voice and, and pray for us as we go.